Now, hopefully um, I'm gonna be speaking to the computer and to all of you. So I hope you just bear with me. This is our first night of doing a hybrid meeting and um, I'm sure you guys can hear me, but the Zoom crowd, if you cannot hear me on Zoom, would you please raise your hand um, just to let me know that you can't, you know, if you can't hear me. I can see a number of you, so it seems to be all right. I know you're all you're all muted, and that's for the purpose of allowing our speaker Liam to speak to us um, tonight. Anyway, uh, thanks very much, everybody, for joining, and thanks for bearing with us on getting started. Uh, we're doing the hybrid meetings because we had such a great response over the last two years with them, and we had a very um, a very loyal audience from all over the world. And I know some of you were familiar with the Zoom meetings because you attended them on Zoom. We used to do a call out there um, of where people were from. And we found people are calling or coming in from Australia and Canada and America and all over. And it's great to have that membership um, from all over the world. Anyway, so I'm going to get started right away um, to thank you and to thank Liam Irwin for coming. Liam is going to speak to us tonight about um, TJ Westrop, Thomas Johnson Westrop, um, a very well-known um, historian, botanist, uh, and, and a number of archaeologists, and, and you'll tell us all about him anyway. Um, for those of you uh, who may not know Liam, Liam is the retired chair of the Department of History at Mary Immaculate College. Um, he's also very involved with Tomond Archaeological and Historical Society, and um, he's, uh, um, he's written numerous articles and publications. And um, anyway, he's the expert, as far as I'm concerned, on, on Westrop. And he, um, anyway, we're delighted to have him and it's great to have him here. So I'm going to share my screen now um, and that should do it. He's a person. He was born at um, this house <laughs> at Eatley which is near Patrick's Way, um, just outside the uh, city uh, in uh, 1860. He was um, the youngest child of uh, a man called John Westrop, who was a descendant of the Westrop family, um, uh, Cromwellians essentially, um, in England, they liked to claim that they went back to the medieval period in Yorkshire. Um, whether they did or not, I think is, is uh, unclear. But they certainly came to Ireland um, during the Cromwellian regime. And um, the earliest ancestor of Thomas Johnson was a man called Monteford Westrop, who um, essentially worked for the Cromwellian regime uh, in the 1650s. Um, he was what was called controller of the port of Limerick in uh, 1660. And like most of the Cromwellians, he managed to survive the um, elimination of Cromwell and his Republic and managed to be accepted by the restoration of the monarchy by Charles II, and indeed the Westrops went on to um, acquire substantial land. First of all, uh, in the unsettled conditions after the Cromwellian plantation, and then particularly uh, after the Battle of the Boyne, the Treaty of Limerick, when um, many of the land that was confiscated by William of Orange was actually sold. Uh, Thomas Johnson Westrop uh, was um, always keen to emphasize and um, proud really of the fact that none of his family's land was acquired through the plantations. Um, and that appears to be the case. Um, most of it was in one way or another acquired and bought um, outside any of the uh, formal confiscations. But on the other hand, uh, essentially all their land, um, you know, was land that had been confiscated uh, from their uh, uh, original owners. Um, Thomas Johnson Westrop's father uh, had um, about 
certainly when uh, he was born, um, had um, oh, the Atty Flynn estate in Limerick was relatively small. That was about 600 acres, but uh, he had at least three and a half thousand acres in uh, County Clare. And indeed, originally, um, before the famine, that seems to have been up to around um, uh, 7,000 acres. Um, John Westrop was um, married first to um, a good Clare woman, Georgina Stamer, and um, he had uh, seven children, four sons and three daughters. Uh, she was his first cousin, and uh, she died in 1852. And um, four years later, in 1856, he remarried, um, presumably, he found his first marriage to a first cousin quite agreeable. So for his second wife, he took another first cousin, um, um, a woman called Charlotte Louisa Whitehead. And um, they had two children. They had a daughter who died as an infant. And in 1860, their uh, only surviving child together, uh, our friend Thomas Johnson uh, at Westra. He was um, subject to many of the um, peculiar practices of the Victorians. Uh, there he is at the age of four. As you know, it wasn't unusual to dress uh, little boys um, as girls, uh, certainly uh, wearing dresses and whatever. Um, I don't know if anybody would work out whatever psychological damage um, uh, <laughs> Uh, resulted from uh, uh, all of that. Um, he was, um, he never essentially went to uh, school. He was educated at home uh, by private tutors, particularly uh, by a man called Mr. Sullivan, who um, was, was appointed uh, really um, uh, during his teenage years, and who seems to have had a very uh, strong and enduring uh, influence on the young Westrop. Uh, you can see this quote is from Westrop's diary, and um, obviously Mr. Sullivan didn't believe in modern psychology of praising pupils and encouraging them. Um, and um, Westrop's diary gives us an insight into um, his childhood and his what we would now call teenage years. Um, in contrast really to his adult life where uh, no uh, diaries, no personal letters, um, there's really no insight into uh, his personal life once he becomes a, an adult. But this diary, which is um, in the hands of the antique dealer in County Limerick, George Stackpool, who's a, a, a descendant of Westrop's, and uh, uh, I acknowledge his kindness in making uh, that diary um, uh, available uh, to me. Um, so uh, this quote from the diary about considering him a precious blockhead. Um, I think Mr. O'Sullivan did um, have a higher regard for him really than that, which he did uh, um, uh, ex express to, to others. Um, he was um, always from his childhood uh, extremely close uh, to his mother and she to him. Uh, she was in his, her practice when he was born. And um, even though he had a very good relationship with his stepbrothers and sisters, um, the bond really between him and his mother um, uh, endured uh, 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 throughout uh, her life. Particularly perhaps because um, in 1866, when he was six years old, uh, his father um, died. And um, the um, family estate essentially uh, then passed to his uh, oldest brother. However, the brother was pursuing uh, an army career 
uh, in England and uh, Thomas Johnson's mother made an arrangement with her stepson that she would rent uh, Atty Flynn and uh, therefore Westrop was able to grow up there. Uh, in 1876, they did move uh, across the road to um, another house called Springfort, uh, both of which indeed um, still survive and, and are, 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 are lived in. And uh, he was there until 1879, when he went to study in uh, Trinity College. Um, again, uh, his diary gives us um, fascinating information about uh, the process of admission to Trinity uh, and the fact that um, everybody, uh, his own family and the aforementioned O'Sullivan were convinced that he had no hope of being admitted to um, Trinity. Uh, but in fact, he was. And um, he began by taking uh, an arts degree. And uh, after obtaining his MA, he proceeded to study civil engineering and qualified as a civil engineer uh, in uh, uh, 1885. Um, the, uh, we know that um, he was apprenticed to um, a, a, I say, a significant Dublin engineer, a man called Bindon Blood Stoney, who was the um, chief engineer of the Dublin Post and Docks Board. And um, after uh, uh, about two years' apprenticeship, he was appointed the assistant surveyor. Um, in County Mead. That's a kind of um, county engineer um, uh, kind of post. Uh, there is one reference <coughs> to him doing some work on uh, river drainage, but um, within a relatively short time, certainly by um, 1888, he had given up work and essentially uh, for the rest of his life, devoted himself entirely to scholarship, to surveying, to studying history, and um, essentially becoming a private uh, antiquarian. Um, it's not exactly clear how he managed to do that. Uh, he obviously had inherited uh, family money, his mother died in 1891, uh, and he undoubtedly inherited her estate. Um, and when he died, he had a very substantial holding of stocks and shares. So uh, that, of course, would not be unusual, uh, but perhaps he was adept at investing and um, made some money that way. Uh, either way, he obviously was able to live comfortably and uh, devote his life um, to, as I say, uh, the uh, pursuit of uh, antiquarianism. Um, he never married and um, he lived, uh, first of all, um, in what we might call digs when he was in Trinity, but um, within a short time, his mother had decamped to Dublin. Uh, they rented a house uh, in Trafalgar Terrace in Mountstown, and he lived with her until she died, as I say, in 1891. He then moved to 77 Leeson Street in uh, a house that was owned by a woman called Bertha Hart, who seems to have been from Killarney. And um, we don't know that much about her. She was a single woman. Looks like she kept um, guests or boarders because when uh, Westrop's nephew went to study medicine in Trinity College uh, sometime later, um, he also uh, lived at 77 Leeson Street. And um, indeed, within a couple of years, even before he had qualified in Trinity, he had promptly married Bertha. And um, in around eight, 1902, um, the um, nephew and his wife 
were living um, in Sandy Mount, in Strand Road, and Westrop moved in with them and lived with his nephew, nephew's wife, and their two children uh, for the rest of his life. And they, they became the uh, main beneficiaries uh, uh, of his will. So that, that's the kind of family uh, background. That's the kind of a glimpse that we get of his personal life. But beyond that, as I say, there are really no sources other than um, vague comments about other people uh, about him. He seems uh, a very pleasant, affable uh, gentleman, but totally dedicated indeed to um, uh, the life that he decided uh, to pursue and, and to live. The Royal Society of Antiquaries were uh, of great importance uh, for him and for his work. Um, and um, you see there in 1893, he became a fellow. He was the president of the society on two separate occasions and uh, did a lot of um, voluntary work for them, um, looking after their photographic collection, indexing their journal and other publications, being involved in various other um, uh, uh, committees, and of course, um, publishing a great deal of his research and his surveys in their uh, um, uh, actual um, um, journal. Um, just one, um, before I move on to looking at the detail uh, of his work, there's just one um, excerpt from the diary, just, just to um, uh, quote it, that um, gives some kind of insight perhaps into him. He's talking about going to church um, uh, near Patrick's Well, their local Church of Ireland church was Kilpeacon. And uh, he has this account of going to church on um, Sunday, the 18th of March, being the day after St. Patrick's Day. Mr. Gobbins, who, who was the rector, gave us a 40 minute long sermon on St. Patrick, King Caroticus, Odin, Palladius, the decree of Hayden, the bombing of Rome, Caesar's commentaries, the Shamrock, the Arians, the Arian races, the um, Hill of Tara, Bale, Goldsmith's histories, and proving that St. Patrick was not a gentleman, but a Protestant. <laughs> uh, so, um, as I say, he uh, devotes his life and spends his many days and years uh, on activities like this, going out into the field, uh, examining, measuring, surveying, and writing about the uh, 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 antiquities that um, um, he felt needed to be um, looked at, written about, and um, 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 looked after. Um, his output, um, um, is, I suppose, really the, the uh, only word for it is um, uh, extraordinary. Um, um, overall, uh, if you, as far as I can count up, uh, and including major articles, minor articles, notes, um, uh, queries, answering particular uh, items and whatever, um, his output uh, uh, amounts to over 300 uh, publications. Um, now, he never actually wrote uh, a standard book. Uh, he did write a short life of Brian Baru, uh, but other than that, um, all of his publications tended to be in learned journals. The uh, Journal of the Society of Antiquaries that I mentioned, the Proceedings of the Royal Irish Academy, um, the um, Journal of what later became the Thomond Archaeological Society in Limerick, initially the Limerick Field Club, 
and subsequently renamed the, the North Munster uh, uh, Archaeological um, uh, Journal and um, a variety of other uh, local journals and publications. He also sometimes, uh, particularly in County Clare and particularly in the Clare Journal, he would write popular versions uh, of his uh, academic articles uh, to make them available in uh, a more accessible form uh, to uh, um, a wider um, uh, audience. Um, in terms of his major contributions, um, I suppose his major, you can argue which was his major work. Certainly uh, his study of promontory forts uh, was one of his major contributions in terms of the amount of field work involved, um, the number of sites examined, and the fact that these structures you know, the promontory forts are essentially um, um, defended coastal um, uh, promontories um, um, and um, very little was known about them prior to his time and they had um, obtained very little study. So this was very important uh, pioneering uh, um, uh, work. And as I say, going out on the coast, out along cliffs and whatever, uh, difficult um, uh, field work uh, involved. Um, he went on numerous occasions to the Iron Islands and um, documented the um, wonderful range of prehistoric structures there. He took part in an important survey of Clare Island between 1909 and uh, 1911. Uh, he compiled a full list of Irish round towers in 1899, something that hadn't existed prior to that, and provided very important notes on um, round towers that had been demolished and which he had uh, researched from the uh, documentary sources. Other people would say his major work was that published in 1902 in the Royal Irish Academy Journal, The Ancient Forts of Ireland, um, a article of 147 pages, uh, you know, virtually a book uh, in itself um, um, with um, extraordinary range of uh, not only um, giving the location and uh, details of the fort, but the, the historical background that he had researched and very detailed and important drawings, diagrams, scale um, plans, and uh, indeed sketches uh, of those. Another publication to mention in 1913 was a, an important paper on early Italian maps of Ireland between 1300 and 1600, and uh, which included very uh, informative notes on uh, settlers and traders uh, in Ireland uh, during, during that particular period. Um, you could say that he published material on uh, virtually every part of Ireland, and there are very few counties that he hasn't something um, noted or are written about. But undoubtedly the main focus of his work was on his um, native county of Limerick and uh, particularly here in Clare. Just very briefly about Limerick, uh, his most important work was a full survey of uh, all the uh, ancient and medieval churches uh, in the um, County in, in the diocese, indeed, uh, in, in um, published in 1905, uh, 381 pages. He followed that up with a similar, uh, very con comprehensive um, uh, survey of um, all of the uh, castles. Um, again, um, over 400 castles 
uh, noted and, and listed. Um, he also did a survey of forts um, uh, in the county and important papers on uh, structures like St. Mary's Cathedral and on uh, the medieval um, monastic ruins of places like Adair, Askeaton, uh, Ballingarry, Carrigogonal, places like that. And um, also wrote um, quite a lot on uh, Limerick uh, folklore. But as I say, um, above all, the um, bulk of his work uh, certainly uh, related to County Clare. Um, I've again added up 145 articles or notes uh, relating um, to County Clare. His very first publication, indeed, um, shortly after um, he abandoned his engineering work, um, his first publication in the uh, Antiquaries Journal was on uh, Quinn Friary. Um, in terms of trying to categorize uh, uh, his work, um, initially his work on Clare, uh, as, <clears throat> as indeed elsewhere, tended to be primarily historical. So for example, in 1889, uh, he writes a very important historical article on uh, Ennis Friary, and also provides uh, notes on the um, Spanish Armada ships that were wrecked off the coast of Clare. Uh, 1891, he has an important article on the sheriffs of County Clare, and uh, follow that up with a study of the Norman uh, conquest, essentially, um, um, uh, in Thomond. Uh, he also concentrated early on in the early uh, 1890s on Killaloo, uh, writing articles on its palaces and uh, its cathedral. Um, after that, from 1893, when he begins his first of a series on stone forts, uh, you find his writings are predominantly on the uh, prehistoric uh, structures uh, uh, of the county. Um, and uh, again, these are um, studied in great detail um, and effectively he produces this um, comprehensive survey of um, all the prehistoric sites, you might say, uh, uh, in the county. Uh, usually on a regional basis, 1893, he talks about the stone forts in uh, uh, what he calls Central Clare. 1896, he studies Loop Head. In uh, 1901, he moves on to Northwest Clare. Uh, 1905, he's studying the antiquities in what he calls the borders of the Burren. Uh, 1913, around Corrib Finn. Uh, 1915 in the Burren itself, 1916 Ina and 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 Kilimer. In 1901, he produces um, again uh, a major survey of the uh, what he calls the Cahars or the forts of County Clare, um, listing in all 2,420 uh, forts um, in the county. Uh, providing the names, the locations, the particular features, uh, measurements, and very often uh, a bibliography, if it existed, if there were uh, previous publications of uh, uh, each of those sites. Um, 1895, he starts a series of articles on the prehistoric remains of the barony of Burren, uh, that's continued in 1898, 1899, and uh, again in uh, 1911. He also did major work on prehistoric and medieval churches in Clare. Um, in 1894, he has um, an important article, Churches with Round Towers in uh, North Clare. In 1900, um, the, again, a major continuation of that study, Churches of County Clare, 
and uh, important historical research into the origin of uh, ecclesiastical uh, divisions. Um, between 1908 and 1913, he has a series of studies on the ring forts of East Clare. Um, in addition to all of that, he devoted a lot of time and attention to folklore. And um, his folklore studies of County Clare uh, uh, were extremely important. Again, published every year between 1910 and 1914. And many of you are probably aware of the CLASP Press republication of uh, much, much of that um, uh, folklore. Invaluable that he collected it at that time uh, and saved um, um, so much that would probably have been lost. 1911, he has an important study of St. Mokhala of Tulla and um, of interest to all these people. Um, um, again, he published, interestingly, quite a lot about County Clare in the uh, Limerick Journal, in the um, Journal of the um, uh, Limerick Field Club, um, uh, as it was mostly at that time, it, it eventually changed its name. Um, so that, that he has um, studies there of um, um, really um, Liston Varna, um, the antiquities around Liston Varna, published that in um, um, 1906, Lehench, 1908, uh, Carriga Holt, 1910, 1912, Kilkee, 1913, 14, Bonrassi, uh, 19, uh, uh, 15. Again, uh, separate publication on the cysts, dolmens, and Pillars of Clare, published in 1902 uh, in two parts, first of all, a study of east of the county and then uh, subsequently the uh, uh, west of the county. And um, also um, published a study of the castles, what he called very often the lesser castles and um, peel towers in 1899. Another important study in uh, Ma Ayer. Um, I'm just listing some of those just to show the sheer um, enormous uh, scale of his work, uh, 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 superhuman uh, almost one, one might feel. And when you bear in mind the difficulties of undertaking all of that field work uh, in the time in which he lived, the um, uh, problems of transport, of um, uh, going out in all weathers, finding uh, these sites, many of them, um, you know, overgrown, uh, not easily found. And uh, I just have a few of these slides to show the, um, uh, perhaps convey uh, the uh, uh, nature um, um, uh, of that. Um, he, he didn't really actually publish very much on uh, the uh, megalithic tombs or the, the dolmens or cromlechs, as uh, he would have um, called them. There, there already had been a major publication by a man called Borlas, uh, to which indeed um, Westrop very generously contributed a lot of his notes and surveys. So he, he often, in terms of his publication, um, confined himself to making corrections and additions to uh, the work that had um, uh, al already uh, uh, been there. Um, his surviving records, particularly his notebooks, are quite extraordinary. They, they, uh, they really are, are uh, work works of art. And um, they also show the meticulous um, way he went about his work, um, make, making detailed diagrams, detailed, accurate, carefully measured plans, providing uh, beautiful sketches, works of, of art in themselves. Now, from an early age, um, 
his mother had always been taking him uh, on uh, excursions in the country doing sketching. So he had inherited some of her interest and artistic talent in that way. And then, of course, his training as a civil engineer was important uh, for his plans as well. But then um, the notebooks um, then contain um, in this very, very um, detailed, closely written uh, notes, uh, research in the libraries and archives, which he constantly used to back up and supplement um, his, his field work. Um, well, these survive in different places, most of them in the Royal Irish Academy, but uh, Clare Archives has, um, as, as you probably know, um, a, a wonderful um, example of his uh, notebooks for uh, 1881, as far as I remember, <clears throat> with, with um, uh, again, uh, something like that, this uh, range of, of detail. But every page you would turn in um, uh, these uh, would, um, you know, uh, lighten your spirits. They are just, just uh, so wonderful. Again, example of his sketching. Uh, again, accurate detail um, and, um, you know, of, of a high artistic uh, uh, quality as well. Here's he's doing surveys of and drawings of uh, round towers. Now, a great many um, of these drawings and plans, as well as these descriptions, uh, of course, are invaluable uh, today. Uh, very often where sites have either been destroyed or have been significantly uh, altered. And um, almost any academic archeological um, uh, publication today you will go through the footnotes and repeatedly you will have uh, Westrop uh, footnotes. Uh, so um, not only invaluable um, in his own time and for his own generation, but uh, an enduring legacy um, uh, down to uh, uh, our own time. Again, shows, for example, uh, his indefatigable journeying uh, out to Schellig and uh, the wonderful drawings that he did uh, uh, there. Just one example again of um, the um, uh, extraordinary and uh, impressive detailing of his plans. Um, uh, everything uh, measured so carefully. Um, the chapel is not just 24 feet by 11, it's 11 and three inches. Um, and uh, all of them, um, any, anybody, today who has ever um, um, re-surveyed his plans are always struck by how um, invariably uh, accurate uh, all of his uh, uh, work was and um, supplemented um, again by, you know, indicating the vegetation that was growing in the area and uh, all the rest of it. Um, again, how many people go out to Cannon Island, Cannons Island today um, um, and, you know, find that plan so invaluable to have uh, when they go there. Um, just as a sidelight, one of the um, intriguing things is that he often, not always, he, he signs his drawings or his sketches, sometimes TJW and sometimes TJ Westrop. But uh, on occasion, he has this um, uh, curious um, symbol. It's a swastika, uh, I like, and what looks like the figure seven uh, uh, attached to it. Um, I don't know what it means. I have not managed to find anybody who has um, any information on um, uh, what that meant to him or why he um, uh, actually uh, used that. That's one of these intriguing features of it. Um, he, one, um, he doesn't ever anywhere spell out what you might call a philosophy of his work, but um, in between some of his publications, you do uh, get an insight into his thoughts. 
And um, one of them was his reluctance to offer theories. Uh, as you see there, I have no intention to originate theories in these papers. Researches in Irish ethnology, lists of the actual distribution of the forks, records of the implements and other objects found in them must first be made before satisfactory theories become possible. And he was in a way reacting to the fact that in his time and prior to that, people loved coming up with um, all kinds of theories without having really made any detailed study or having any um, convincing uh, evidence for the theories that way they were actually um, uh, propounding. Um, you can see uh, from his background as Church of Ireland men, he often likes to quote uh, the Bible. Uh, so he says there, meanwhile, to be a seeker is to be of the best sex, to be a finder. And though theories die, facts live and remain current coin. Uh, sometimes he was criticized in his publications, um, often by academics or so-called academics of the time who um, said his articles were very dry, they were very boring, they were long lists, details, descriptions, measurements, but no grand theories, no great explanations. Uh, and um, Westrop, of course, was quite rightly, quite unapologetic about that. What were needed, what was needed, were not theories without evidence, what was needed was the basic groundwork, the basic spade work that needed to be done. And he saw himself uh, uh, providing um, that necessary base. Another insight you get uh, uh, into his preoccupations, particularly as the land war and the um, land league um, became more powerful um, was a worry that if and when landlordism disappeared and when the farmers became the owners of their land, that they wouldn't look after antiquities the way he felt that uh, the landlords uh, had. And he becomes quite critical about um, the, I suppose you'd say, narrow nature uh, as he saw it of uh, Irish nationalism. So little does the professed patriotism of the men of Clare um, that should be bear fruit in the care or preservation of their country's past, that since I began my work on the county, the ruin of its remains is uh, uh, alarming. And um, he, he was indeed uh, very, very um, um, concerned um, uh, about that the fact that he felt that um, more and more of um, the um, remains of the past were um, uh, coming uh, uh, under threat. And um, his um, uh, view, um, as I say, was that um, um, this would only get worse um, uh, uh, with um, peasant proprietorship, as, as it was called. Um, both of his sisters were uh, married to very substantial Clare uh, landlords, of course. Uh, his elder sister, Alice, was married to um, uh, Richard Stackpole of uh, Eden Vale, and uh, his other sister, Mary, uh, married to um, um, O'Callaghan in Lismahan in, in Tulla, and uh, famous or infamous, of course, for the uh, Bodaic evictions and, and, and whatever. Um, Westrop is undoubtedly, I would say, a liberal um, unionist. Um, um, he is a uh, Freemason um, and, and um, re reasonably active, I think, uh, in Freemasonry on, on at least two occasions, he has um, what you call office holding um, uh, in, in the Freemasons. 
Um, sometimes in his writings, he talks about us all being subjects of the British Empire. Another occasion calls himself the countryman of Shakespeare and Milton. On the other hand, when um, the family were described as West Britons, uh, he became um, uh, quite ir irate. And uh, he wrote, the Westrocks were not West Britons, as if they were Welsh or of some kin to Lloyd George. They were either Norse, to judge from their thick skulls, or more Irish than the McNamara's of Ennith Simon. Um, I know any McNamara's here to get upset by, by, by uh, that, that particular claim. Um, Westrop, you might think surprisingly, uh, never involved himself in um, excavation. Um, now, he was um, uh, uh, in favor of uh, uh, excavation and indeed complained at various times of lack of official funding um, uh, for excavations. But presumably he felt he lacked any particular expertise in um, digging or in archaeology. And um, when you look at some of the excavations that were conducted in his time, you could see why he might have reservations. You know, people excavating using dynamite and um, um, other scary kind of um, um, uh, stories that you have there. Um, the other point, of course, is given what I've been outlining about uh, the range of his work, uh, where would he have found the time for uh, uh, excavations as well? Another, um, um, and, and indeed, um, when, when you think of the um, physical toll that um, uh, his work uh, must, must have taken uh, on him on these large scale uh, surveys, Again, you get a, a hint of that uh, at, uh, at one point in his writings where he talks about uh, after a long day spent in climbing over rocks and dangerous walls with ever growing weariness, pain and lameness, one reaches a fort far from the road. The dull light or the moss and bushes conceal steps or even a closed or half buried gateway. Um, and um, you know, the, the just gives one insight when you think about in the um, context of the time and the uh, work that that um, he had to um, uh, undertake. Sometimes in his writings as well, you get an indication of, of his uh, uh, methodology. Doesn't ever spell it out directly, but um, it, it becomes clear he saw that the first step was to get out in the field, do the necessary uh, field work, do the survey, and then uh, draw the plans. Uh, make sketches, not only of the principal monument, but also of any important or distinctive features uh, 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 in that. Um, he was careful about dating, saying any attempts at dating anything should begin from any clues in the surviving fabric and parallels should be sought from other structures in the uh, local context. And then perhaps trying to find examples at the uh, national level. Again, he was one of the few perhaps in his time to stress um, a uh, overall approach, utilizing all disciplines so that history, language, folklore, as well as fieldwork and archaeology um, uh, 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 should be uh, um, uh, employed. He's quite in interesting as well about place names and particularly about accuracy in uh, uh, place names. He felt very strongly that um, the primary source for pronunciation and meaning of place names should be from local people. Uh, 
preferably people without or with very little education. And his um, uh, argument about that uh, essentially was that if people had some education and had read about uh, place name theory or whatever, or had um, uh, some linguistic knowledge, they'd be influenced by that. Whereas he felt that local people having had this information about pronunciation and meaning passed down to them, that they were the um, surest, uh, purest way of um, uh, getting at the um, uh, meaning uh, um, of a place name. Um, he says the, the, he was very worried even by the um, Ordnance Survey people like O'Donovan and um, uh, uh, O'Curry, that they had theories of their own and that they were foisting their own ideas or their own um, learning uh, onto um, uh, place names. And uh, he wrote an article indeed uh, about um, a stone fort uh, up near Blackhead called Carig Cahardoon Fergus. Um, and um, you know, he, he showed that um, Fergus had been um, introduced into it by um, the um, Ordnance survey people because they had a particular uh, 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 theory of their own uh, that 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 they wanted to um, uh, 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 propose. Um, he also felt very strongly um, opposed to the restoration of monuments. Um, that um, the um, the only thing that should be done um, really to uh, any kind of ancient uh, structure was that they should be stabilized. That uh, if they were in danger of collapse, uh, do the minimum amount of work that would be um, um, uh, necessary to prevent decay. But, um, um, and again, because of so much of what was going on in his time, um, had no basis, they were being restored inaccurately or um, um, with, you know, excessive uh, 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 alteration. Um, and um, he um, argued again very um, 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 uh, strongly um, um, against that. Um, the uh, other aspects of his life, um, he, he led such a rich and uh, complex life that you could be here to midnight actually talking about so many aspects of his life. Um, photography, again, had been uh, a feature of his life from his teenage years. He was given a camera as a teenager, and indeed some of his um, uh, earlier uh, field work uh, even before he went to Trinity, uh, involved um, going on, on day trips from uh, his home in Etty Flynn and um, sketching and drawing, certainly, but also uh, taking photographs of uh, antiquities and uh, houses, um, again, which are um, a very important uh, source. Um, you know, photography is still not that widespread um, particularly in in his youth, so that 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 his work uh, uh, was was of uh, particular uh, uh, significance. Um, but what I'm focusing on here was in the aftermath of the 1916 rising. Um, he went out into the streets of Dublin and took um, a huge range of photographs of the destruction of the city uh, after the rise. And again, they are a very important uh, source now. Again, his photographs um, uh, survive in um, a, a variety of 
of uh, locations. Uh, for example, the National Museum of Ireland has 4,000 um, uh, images. Uh, the National Library uh, uh, of Ireland has uh, 1,300, and there's uh, um, these 1916 uh, photographs that I'm talking about there um, uh, in the uh, Royal Irish Academy. And there are other collections in the National Photographic uh, Archive and, and elsewhere. Um, that's a feature if you want to uh, study um, uh, Westrop uh, or um, access some of the um, extraordinary range of sources that we left behind. <coughs> um, you know, you, they, they are scattered um, mainly in the um, Dublin uh, Libraries, uh, really, particularly, um, as I say, the Royal Irish Academy Library and the Royal Society of Antiquaries. He also um, donated um, material to Trinity College and um, lots of Westrop material. Well, not lots of it, but some of it still turn up in auctions. Um, he also undoubtedly had a very extensive library. But uh, unfortunately, um, we presume his nephew uh, inherited the library, uh, but the nephew's sons, um, uh, one of them died young, one of them emigrated, and eventually his library and material uh, finished up in County Wicklow uh, uh, in a very damp uh, house and, um, um, more or less disappeared, a lot of it perhaps disintegrated. Um, so that um, uh, there is no collection of his library. Um, and apart from what he donated to the libraries that I mentioned, um, various uh, material turns up. I know the University of Limerick, the Father John Leonard collection, there's some uh, material there. Uh, there was an auction in Parcels of Bar the other day, and uh, one of his notebooks relating to County Galway um, uh, turned up there. So that's probably um, material, West, West Rock material out there. However, um, because he was such a conscientious um, publisher, uh, unlike a lot of archaeological excavation reports that never see the light of day. Uh, almost everything you will find in Westrop's notebooks and in his manuscripts were the basis of his publications and um, uh, were uh, in, indeed uh, um, published. Um, he began to suffer from uh, ill health, uh, probably from his uh, 50s uh, uh, onwards. Uh, he remained, as you see, much like the earlier photograph, quite a dapper, uh, well-dressed gentleman into middle age because, um, um, I mean, he, he was only 62 when, 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 when he died. Um, he um, suffered from kidney disease, which seems to have been what led to his uh, uh, early death. Uh, his will is uh, interesting in that he says, I direct that my funeral shall be strictly private and conducted in the most inexpensive manner. And I shall be buried in the earth. After a doctor shall have examined my body and pronounced life to be extinct. Um, I've forgotten it again. I looked up the word for a fear of being buried alive. Um, there, there is a technical term for uh, being buried alive, I've, I've written down somewhere, um, but it looks like he may have suffered from that and whatever, that, that um, he wanted to make sure that, that he was actually dead. He also requested that he only wanted a plain tombstone or a Celtic cross with a simple uh, inscription. And finally, that I wish to be buried near my dear mother in Kilpeacon Church, which um, you know, was, in, was and is the local um, uh, place for, for um, um, uh, Ashley Flynn. 
it would appear that his wishes were not honored. Um, at least there is no Celtic cross or no tombstone to indicate that he was um, uh, buried uh, uh, in the earth. So we presume he was placed in the family vault uh, in Kilpeakin, where his um, father and mother uh, uh, were buried. And um, this year, the Shannon Historical and Archaeological Society, um, there, there was no mention of him um, uh, in, in the tomb. The Shannon Society um, uh, erected this lovely plaque uh, in uh, uh, his memory with, um, I think, a lovely inscription, antiquarian artist and photographer. And that indeed encapsulating the three um, contributions of his life to antiquarianism and being the artist and the photographer who devoted his life to recording Ireland's uh, uh, antiquities, which um, um, uh, indeed, uh, without question, um, 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 uh, was uh, what he did. Um, the, as I say, there are so many different areas and aspects of his life that one could go into. And I will be delighted if anybody has queries or questions about any aspect of his life that I didn't cover or indeed that, that I did. But I'd just like to finish by uh, this, um, from excerpt from his presidential address to the Royal Irish Society of Antiquaries in 1916, which was a kind of a, it was already in ill health, was a kind of a, of a farewell. So he says, so we may hope that in the future, men train to sterner sacrifice than we, without seeking for any great fame, still less for any material reward, may work beside us in the field of Irish archaeology till we fail and then take the torch from our hands and carry it on into the darkness farther even than we uh, ever dared to hope. Um, he, in his dedicated, unselfish, committed life to uh, Irish heritage and Irish archaeology uh, was a living uh, uh, example of that. And uh, as I said at the beginning, I think somebody who deserves to be remembered uh, given our um, current uh, interest in uh, commemorations and uh, centenaries. Thank you very much. Thank you.